Hi everyone, my name is Nicholas with Redshift. In this video we'll do a quick overview of Redshift for Maya, starting with the installation and then checking out some of the render settings available for Redshift. For more details on the topics we cover in this video, you can refer to the, the online Redshift documentation at docs.redshift3d.com. So we'll go ahead by starting uh, an installation here. I downloaded Redshift uh, 1.0.39. I'm going to run that. Uh, it's pretty much a standard installer. We'll click through. We've got the license agreement. You should read it. Um, and then we come here to select which uh, packages we want to install Redshift for. So this machine has a whole bunch of versions of XSI and Maya already installed and that's why these are all pre-selected but I'm going to deselect all these and only install Redshift for Maya 2014. And it's installing. And it's done. So at this point, uh, if, you're, if you've purchased a license of Redshift um, and you haven't activated your license yet on, the, on your machine, you can check this and it'll run the, the licensing tool. Uh, if you're using the demo version, that, this step's not necessary. Or if you've already activated your license on, on the machine you're using, you don't need to activate it every time you install a new version of Redshift. So we'll just finish this and we're going to check whether Redshift was correctly installed. So let's go ahead and open up the plugin manager. We see Redshift listed here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and load the plugin. And we see down here in the status that Redshift version 1.0.39 is loaded. That's great. If here instead you get an error red in red that says the specified module could not be found, 99% of the time that means that your uh, GPU drivers are out of date. So if that happens, just shut down Maya, uh, grab the latest drivers from the NVIDIA website and install them, and then try this again. Load up Maya, try to load the Redshift plugin. And like I said, 99% of the time that'll solve your problem. We're going to go ahead and uh, click auto load here. That way the Redshift plugin will load every time we start up Maya. And we'll pop open the render globals here and take a look. Yep, Redshift is available as a, as a renderer. We've got all the options. And let's jump over to the system tab and take a look down here. And this here we list uh, the, the CUDA devices that were detected uh, by Redshift. And so here we see, you know, Quadro K6000 and GeForce GTX 750. Both have been pre-selected by Redshift. So by default, Redshift will select all the available CUDA devices on your machine. And on this page, you can, you can turn them on or off if you want. Okay, so now that we've installed Redshift and verified that it's loading correctly in Maya, Let's do a brief overview of the various settings in the render globals. So I'll first open up a scene here. We'll take a look. Redshift's been selected here as the renderer. We have the common tab. This common tab should be familiar to anybody who's familiar with rendering in Maya. Uh, it's very similar to the common tab that you'll see in Mental Ray or the Maya software renderer. Uh, the only minor differences are that we have a slightly different list of output file formats supported, but generally you should feel right at home here. So let's jump over to the output tab and focus on this first section here about progressive rendering. So Redshift supports two distinct rendering modes, progressive rendering and bucket rendering. With bucket rendering, the frame is rendered on a block-by-block -block basis, as you can see here. On the other hand, with progressive rendering, the frame is rendered incrementally in passes. So you start with a noisy frame almost immediately, and it's progressively cleaned with each pass. Progressive rendering is especially useful when you're making tweaks to your scene. So here I can 
rotate the camera. I can modify the material on the dragon here. I'm going to go ahead and make it yellow or blue. I can rotate the light. And as you can see, you get almost instantaneous feedback to your edits. By default, Redshift uses progressive rendering for IPR renders and bucket rendering for single frame and animation renders. And that's usually most appropriate in most cases. If you want to override that behavior and, for example, use bucket rendering during IPR, you would go ahead and disable fourth progressive for IPR here. And you can see that the IPR is doing a bucket render. If you want, on the other hand, progressive render on your single frame or animation renders, you would go ahead and click enable here on progressive rendering. And as you can see, the regular rendering is doing progressive rendering. Uh, the number of passes here controls how many progressive passes are going to be done before the frame is considered to be finished. So when you're doing a single frame render, you might want to select something like 128. But if you're using progressive rendering primarily for IPR, you can probably go ahead and leave that at a high value and rely on the fact that IPR will automatically re-render the scene when you make edits. Um, so you don't really care when the frame is you know, finished, so to speak. It's worth noting that in progressive rendering, these settings here, anything basically anything that controls number of samples or number of rays, such as these settings here, they have no effect during progressive rendering. Also, any point-based rendering techniques available in, in Redshift, like subsurface scattering and photon mapping, they have no, they are not currently supported in progressive rendering. So if you're going to use those techniques, you probably want progressive rendering disabled. Okay, so moving on, I'm going to just start a new scene here and we're going to move on uh, to talk about the unified sampling settings. Okay, so I'm going to just go ahead and load up my test scene here and take a look at the unified sampling settings. Let me just start by talking about these settings a little bit. Uh, so the unified sampling settings control how many samples will be taken for each pixel in the final image. And that has a direct effect on how noisy or clean your render will be. So I'm going to start by just showing you what it looks like with these settings and as you can see it's terribly noisy. So what these samples do is Redshift will start by taking the number of samples equal to the min samples per pixel and will take up to the max samples per pixel depending on whether or not it detects any noise. If your frame is noisy because of things like depth of field or motion blur or both in the case of this scene, or if you have visible jaggies along the edges of your geometry, you'll want to increase the number of unified max samples. For the unified min sample settings, despite the fact that we have it at one here, we really recommend that you leave this value at something like 4, 8, 16, or even up to 32 and really avoid low values like one or two samples, since this can lead to Redshift falsely thinking that there's no noise in areas that actually do have noise. So by default, unified sampling uses the same patter pattern of noise of sampling on each frame uh, and when rendering animations, this can sometimes produce noise patterns that seem like they're stuck to the camera. Um, and often that's not desirable. And so to fix that, what you can do is you can turn on this, this setting, randomize pattern on each frame, and that will randomize 
the sampling pattern for each frame and make the noise appear to be more like TV static rather than dirt stuck to the screen. Okay, so as I said, in this example scene, we have depth of field on the whole frame, and then this dragon here on the right is moving uh, vertically, and so we have some motion blur there as well. Um, as you can see, like I said, the, the noise is just completely unacceptable, and uh, we can increase the unified sampling settings Let's bring them up to 416, which would be the default on a new scene. And you can see that while the situation has improved, the, the areas that are highly out of focus here for the depth of field and the areas of large motion here are still quite noisy. So we're going to go ahead and crank that up to 256 max samples. And you can see the situation improves tremendously. There's still a tiny bit of noise. If we, uh, if we go with 512 here, that pretty much clears it up. The sample filtering settings here, these control the anti-aliasing. Um, for the filter size, a larger filter size will give you a softer frame and a smaller filter size will give you a sharper frame but might uh, not clean up all your jaggies. So we generally recommend the default Gauss filter type here. We have a bunch of different filter types. Gauss is usually a good one to use and usually a filter size of two is, is a good compromise between softness and jaggies. Uh, for a if you really want, uh, if, if this is not producing a sharp enough image for you, you can try the Mitchell or Lanxos filters. Now, but with these filters, you have, you're going to have to use a filter size that's larger, let's say five, um, be, just because of the type of filters those are. They require larger filter sizes, otherwise you're going to get strange artifacts. So you see that that looks pretty good. It's probably hard to tell the difference on the video between between those two filters. So that's unified sampling. Uh, moving on, we're going to talk about sampling overrides. So let me just start with a blank slate here. And uh, let's talk about sampling overrides. Open up the scene. Okay, so in Redshift, effects like blurry reflections and refractions, uh, ambient occlusion, area lights, and volumetric lighting are all achieved by shooting multiple rays. And when you shoot more rays, you get less noise. Um, the number of rays used for a given effect is typically controlled by sampling settings on the ind individual light or shader that's involved in the effect. In some situations though, it can be really handy to control these settings at a global level. So for example, if you need to diagnose noise issues in your frame, like you have a scene with multiple area lights and ambient occlusion and some GI, and you're not happy with the amount of noise, and you want to get down to the bottom of, of what effect is causing the noise in your scene. So in this scene here that we have, uh, we've intentionally set it up uh, to be very noisy. And uh, we're going to just go ahead and, and render that. And you can see, you know, it's the noise is awful. Okay. And this scene is, is lit with a dome light and um, has, you know, glossy reflections. And we've intentionally set it up like this so that it so it's very very noisy and we know that the noise is coming from the lights but let's assume we didn't know that and we want to figure out where this noise is coming from so what we can do is use these sampling overrides here to override you know for let's say for reflections if I turn this on this is saying replace all glossy reflection effects 
uh, the number of samples on those to 256. So any shader uh, that's used in the scene that has glossy reflections and has a number of samples setting uh, is going to be affected by this, this override. Uh, now when you do an override, you can either replace the samples or you can actually scale the samples. Um, and a scale means that it's going to take the current number of samples assigned to the effect and scale it up by this number. So if I type in 10 here, um, it's going to go ahead and in, uh, multiply the number of samples on, on every shader that, that uses glossy reflections by 10 times. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and just use the, the replace samples op option. And um, we'll go, go ahead and render this frame. And as you see, reflections are not what was causing the majority of the noise here. Let me increase this window a little. Uh, so we'll do the same with refractions. Now, of course, with no transparency in here, we know that's not going to help. Uh, AO, still noisy, lights. And we see that the, with the, when we've bumped up the samples on the light, we've really cleaned up the fr frame a lot, and the noise is, is basically gone at this point. And I mean, just for the sake of completeness, we'll do volume. And of course, that doesn't change anything because there's no vol volumetric uh, effects going on here. But yeah, so basically the sampling overrides provides a really quick way to diagnose noise issues in your scene. So moving on, we're going to talk about motion blur. Um, and to do that, let's just start from a clean slate here. And I'm going to load up my motion blur scene. So motion blur simulates the effect that you get in a real camera uh, where objects that are moving while the camera shutter is open become blurry. And so you can see um, in this scene we have two dragons that are static and one that is uh, moving up and down. And so if we go ahead and do an IPR here and let's look at our motion blur settings. So motion blur is off and everything is just rendering sort of static and we had no impression of motion. This guy's not blurry at all due to his motion. So we'll go ahead and turn on motion blur and you can see that he blurs nicely. If you have meshes that deform, so this, this dragon here is simply transforming in, you know, vertically. If you have a mesh that deformed, you would turn on, you would also want to turn on enable deformation blur. In this case, because it's a simple animation of a transform, that's not necessary. Uh, the transformation steps here, uh, this controls how many times Redshift will sample the transformation matrix of an object within a given frame. So you'll generally only need to increase this number if you have objects in your scene that move very quickly in some nonlinear way like the blades of a helicopter, for example. Uh, the frame duration setting, this, this setting controls uh, essentially how blurry the objects are going to be uh, due to motion. Uh, the larger the duration, the blurrier the motion will be. Uh, so this value of 10 here means that the shutter is actually open for 10 times longer than one frame. So we're getting very exaggerated motion blur. Uh, if we bring this down to one, this is going to give us, you see the, the blur is much more subtle, but this is actually sort of more correct. This is what you would actually want to see. Um, and it's just going to really smooth out your anima animations. Moving Things that are moving are just going to look a lot more realistic. Okay, moving on to gamma. Uh, gamma, I'm just going to touch on briefly. Um, 
basically a couple of important things to note. First is by default, Redshift displays rendered images at a 2.2 gamma. Uh, a lot of other renderers are defaulting to linear gamma. And we chose a value of 2.2 because this, this represents more, this, this is basically, you know, by default, a proper linear workflow. Uh, the next important thing to note is that Redshift takes into account the color management settings in Maya's render view. So if you come here and look at the color management settings, right now it's set to image and display are both sRGB, which means that no gamma correction is happening by Maya on the pixels that are sent to the render view. And Redshift is aware of this, and so when we set whatever value you set here is the final gamma that's going to be applied. So if this was set to linear and sRGB, with a gamma of 2. Point, which essentially does a 2.2 gamma, this, this value here is going to know that this is there and therefore is, is, is essentially this is not going to do any gamma correction. It's going to let Maya do the gamma correction for it. And you can see if we re-render, we get a proper 2.2 gamma. Okay, next we have environment settings. Um, so for the environment, um, let's go ahead and start a new scene for that. I have, a, I have an example scene for that. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and open up the test scene here. Let's take a look at the options. Environment. So an environment shader is generally used to specify a background to your scene. Uh, Redshift currently supports two types of environment shaders. Uh, the Redshift environment, which does environment mapping and includes advanced functionality such as ray switching and so on. And we have the Redshift physical sky which is actually most often used along with a physical sunlight and a photographic exposure lens shader. Um, the physical sun sky create button here, this basically simplifies setting up a typical sun sky rig into a one click operation. So it creates a physical sky shader along with a physical sun and a photographic exposure lens shader and connects them all up uh, makes it all ready to use. So if I hit create there, you see we've got the physical sky, the exposure, uh, the physical sky here is actually also connected to a sun here. Um, we have all the settings there. Um, next we have the atmosphere slot. Um, this right now currently Redshift just has a single atmosphere shader called Redshift Volume Scattering. Um, this supports fog, height fog, and also global uh, volumetric lighting effects for light beams and so on. Um, so we'll go ahead and render this scene. And so we have some basic height fog here. Uh, if I increase uh, the fog attenuation here, uh, you'll see that the fog basically just gets thicker. Um, let's bring it back down a little bit. And, you know, I can do things like increase the height of the fog. Um, you'll see that the, the fog is just, you know, higher, occupies uh, more space. Uh, if you enter a zero for the height, it basically disables height altogether. And so you have fogging um, regardless of, of, of how high up your your objects are in your scene. And below the environment section, we have connections for various types of lens shaders. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and disable the fog in this scene and, and go ahead and just play with these settings. So we're gonna go ahead and connect a photographic exposure shader um, you see these settings are 
probably familiar if you've used a, a sort of manual type camera before. Uh, we've got film speed, that's the sensitivity of the film. So if you increase this number, the scene will become brighter. Um, we have the shutter time ratio, and this is the, the speed of the shutter. A larger number means a faster shutter. So if, and a faster shutter means less light making it through the sensor. So if I increase this uh, by four times, it'll come back to the original intensity. Uh, the f-stop is the size of the opening in the lens, the aperture. Uh, here, a larger number means a smaller opening and therefore less light coming in. So if I uh, increase this number, you'll, it'll be darker. And if I decrease the number, uh, it will be brighter. Vignetting gives you edge darkening. So a higher number for vignetting will darken the edges of the frame, uh, which you'll sometimes see on a very wide angle lens. I'll, I'll put a large number there just to, just to make it more obvious. You can see that there's darkening here on the edges. Uh, tone mapping uh, with the allowed overexposure, what that does is it reduces the intensity of very, very bright uh, intensities in your scene. And so um, if we put allowed overexposure to one, this means that there's no there's no um, reduction of of overexposure. Um, a smaller value, as you can see from the exposure curve here, will bring down those very intense values. Uh, the black crush, what the black crush does is it makes uh, intensities that are already dark even darker, and uh, sometimes that's referred to adding a toe to your exposure curve. And that basically increases the contrast in your scene. So if I put lots of black crush, uh, I don't know if you notice, but basically you get, you get more contrast in your darks. Uh, the saturation, that basically lets you desaturate or hypersaturate your frame. So if I bring this way down, you'll see it's you know almost black and white. Here it's completely black and white. If I crank it up, um, you, know, you get extremely saturated colors. So that lets you, you, you know, give sort of camera effects uh, to your frame. Next, let's go ahead and add a bokeh shader. Uh, let's, I'm going to go ahead and create a new one. Um, so, you know, as we saw before, um, when we talked about unified sampling, the, the bokeh shader is basically a depth of field shader. And so the focus point here uh, by default, we derive the focus point from the camera's focus point, and that has that's nice because you can animate the focus point. It gives you a a, a nice frame of reference for where, uh, you know, where what part of your frame is going to be sharp. Um, you can do th cool things like animate that focus point in and out uh, to to give you you know a rack focus type effect. Um, so we'll just go ahead and leave that. If you if you want to enter your focus distance. You know, numerically, you can do that too. You see, you know, this is now a hundred units away from the camera. We, I, I'm not sure off the top of my head how far these guys are, but thousands, probably even further, and yeah, it's it's even more blurry. If I bring this down to 40, uh, maybe we'll start getting. Yeah, we'll get part of the dragons are are now in focus. Bring this back here to to derive from camera. Uh, the circle of confusion radius. That basically controls the how blurry the out of focus areas are going to be, and so uh, that that effectively is the size of the the opening, or the the size of the aperture in the lens. And so the larger the opening, the more blurry the out of focus areas are. So if I were to increase this number here um, by a lot, there you can see that those out of focus areas are even more out of focus. And if I reduce that down, you know, to 0.25 then the, the depth of field effect is much more subtle. I mean, it's still there. You see this guy is, is out of focus, but um, you know, much less so than before. Um, if, if we bring that back up, maybe not so high like that, um, we can talk about shutter blades here. So what this, these settings here allow you to uh, change the shape of the diaphragm of the, of the aperture diaphragm which 
you know, by default with a blade count of zero, that's going to give you a circular aperture, perfectly circular. And what that does is it gives you very nice circular out of focus highlights. Uh, but it turns out that in real cameras, of course, the, ap the, the aperture blades are not organized, you know, in a perfectly circular way. And so you can, you can get polygonal out of focus highlights by putting a number in here, like let's say six is going to give you a six sided um, diaphragm. And, and you can see that this starts to have a little bit of shape to it. Um, the blade angle will essentially just rotate uh, that polygonal uh, shape. Um, next we have here the ability to use a bokeh image to control the shape of the of the aperture diaphragm. Uh, this is really useful uh, for basically fully, you know, you have full control over the shape. Um, one really cool use of this is you can use uh, an image that's red, green, and blue circles slightly offset from each other to simulate uh, the effect of chromatic aberration. And I'm going to do that here to show you. Um, if you take a look at our docs online, uh, you'll see uh, an example of that. Um, and actually, I think we include the, the image um, for you to download and play with yourself in your own scenes, but there you go. So here we have, I mean, it's a little bit exaggerated, but you see some, some chromatic aberration. If we change this here to unit intensity, um, this is just gonna basically give, give you different looks. Uh, so that's, that's bokeh. Uh, lens distortion. Uh, this shader, I'm not going to cover an example, but basically what this does is it allows you to distort uh, your frame based on a reference image or an image that's specially generated. And the, this is useful when you're trying to match your rendered images to live action footage that was, of course, filmed with a real camera. And of course, real cameras are not perfect and they're they introduce distortion in the image. And so you can use tools to actually create an image that simulates the same distortion that you'll have in your real lens, and that will make your rendered images match up better with your live action footage. Um, next up, we have uh, the units to meter, the, the photometric, photometric units section here. Um, I'm just going to cover these real quick. Basically, um, here we have the units to meter scale. So in Redshift, uh, lots of the effects in Redshift rely on accurate distance units, like meaningful distance units. Uh, so basically, Redshift needs to know what does one scene unit, uh, what is that in, in real world units? Um, so if you're, it turns out that by convention, Maya's scene units are centimeters, and so by default, this is set to 100, meaning that there are 100 scene units uh, to in one meter, you know, 100 centimeters per meter. If, for example, you're modeling in meters rather than centimeters, you're going to want to set this to one. Um, or if you're modeling in millimeters, you're going to want to set this to a thousand. Um, Oops. The candela per square meter factor. Uh, this you probably won't want to adjust, but basically what it is, it's, it's a, a conversion factor between physical intensity units of candelas per square meter, also known as nits, and non-physical intensities that you might have on, let's say, a point light, like when you put intensity 10, uh, 10 arbitrary intensity units, we need a conversion factor between physical and non-physical units um, because we have physical lights and non-physical lights. And so the, the time that it might be useful to adjust this number would be when you're mixing uh, physical lights, like a physical sun, for instance, with non-physical lights, and you want to globally uh, increase or decrease the intensity of your non-physical lights relative to the physical lights. 
let's say you have a sun and a bunch of point lights and those point lights are so dim that they're not even contributing to the frame uh, and you want to make them all brighter and you don't want to go in and increase the intensity on each light, you can modify this candela uh, per square meter factor uh, to do that in a global way. So that basically covers um, everything, or the majority of the settings here at least, in the output tab. Um, we're going to go ahead and talk about AOVs and, and the rest of them. Um, but first I'm going to close this up, start fresh. Okay, so AOVs, uh, let's take a look. So what's an AOV? Well, an AOV stands for Arbitrary Output Variables. And in a nutshell, AOVs are additional render buffers that hold information about each pixel in the final image, information other than the color. Uh, these AOVs can be used for all sorts of, to make all sorts of adjustments to the image after you've rendered, so basically during the compositing stage. Uh, for example, if you have a depth AOV, a depth AOV encodes the distance between the camera and the surface that's under each pixel. And you can use the depth AOV to simulate things like depth of field uh, in, in the compositing package rather than in the renderer. Uh, or you can use it to do things like adding distance fog, all as post-process effects. So you don't have to re-render your, your entire movie uh, to adjust the depth of field, for instance, you would just have to, you know, redo the depth of field in post. So adding depth of field for, or adding AOVs, excuse me, in Redshift is easy. Um, you have a list of available AOVs here. Uh, for example, to add a depth AOV, I just double click it. Um, this here shows me my list of active AOVs. I can disable an active AOV here by unchecking this checkbox. Let's add a couple more and just, just for fun. Uh, so, you know, I could have them all disabled like that. I could you know, only enable the depth and so on. Um, AOVs have each of them, or so at least most of them, have their own parameters specific to that type of AOV. To inspect those parameters, you click on this inspect button. And here you have. Uh, you know, n rules for naming the file, the type of file that's going to be uh, that's going to be written out, and uh, filtering settings and so on. Anyway, we're not actually going to cover AOVs in depth in this video. It's it's just a really uh, involved topic, and this video is already borderline too long. So we'll go ahead and make a separate uh, video dedicated to AOVs and we'll have a few more of those for some other topics like GI and so on um, just so that you know we can give you the detail go into the detail that that is deserved for these these things so let's move on to this tab here opt optimizations um, the settings we're mostly interested in here are going to be these trace depth settings um, the other settings I we really recommend you leave alone unless you have a specific reason to change them. If uh, you know if you're a really advanced user, some of these can be very useful. If if you get uh, asked by support to you know modify one of these, then of course you know that's fine. But generally, you're just going to want to play with these trace depth settings, and these settings essentially control how many times reflections, refractions, or other ray types can bounce around in the scene. So for example, if you have many layers of glass or other semi-transparent geometry, you'll probably need to increase the number of the, the, the refraction trace depth uh, because at three, it's all the, all the ray is only going to be allowed to go through three uh, transparent surfaces before it stops. Um, Another example is if you're using like a large number of GI bounces, and we're, we're going to cover GI in a little in a few minutes here. Uh, you might also need to increase this this combined um, 
value to compensate. So let's look at a real quick example. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and open the example scene here. And so what you can see is we have a dragon model. Uh, he's inside a box. This is the box here. Uh, this is our camera. This is our perspective camera. If I select it, you see this is our camera. I've, there's a light in there, and this box is actually a, a perfect mirror. Um, and the camera is inside the box, and so what we expect to see here is the dragon reflected uh, sort of over and over again. And let's do a quick render and look at our settings. Not Maybe not what we wanted to see here. We only see a few reflections of the dragon. There's this weird black one here. What's going on, right? Um, maybe it's our trace depth settings. So reflection, three bounces. So we're getting three bounces of reflection and up to six total bounces of any, any kinds of, of uh, bounces. So let's try to max out these guys, see what that gives us. Nothing. So you might wonder, and this, this actually happens to a lot of users, hey, I maxed out my trace step settings, I'm still not getting the number of bounces I expect. And the reason for that is that uh, each material also has trace step settings. And so if we actually look at the mirror material here, um, under optimizations, so you know it's, it's sort of fairly far down in the settings, optimizations, reflections, you see that this mirror material is set to have uh, three, uh, trace up to three for reflections. And that's what's causing us to, to still only have three bounces. So if we crank that up, lo and behold, we get a whole bunch of nice reflections. That looks a lot better. Um, <clears throat> Why do we have this? Uh, the reason is, is that often in many scenes, you don't need a huge number of, of uh, reflections or refractions for all materials in your scene. You might only need it for a certain set of materials. And so having a you know, per material trace depth um, is just another level of optimization uh, that can basically speed up your renders. Okay, so moving on to GI. Let's go ahead and load up the test scene we have for that and render a frame. Okay, you see we have no bounce light here. Uh, so we'll go ahead and turn on, we'll select brute force as our primary GI engine and hit render. And now you see that we have light bouncing off the wall and lighting the backside of the dragon. Now, unfortunately, we've got a fair bit of noise here. It's not very nice. And uh, fortunately, we can simply increase the number of brute force rays, and you can see that that clears up very nicely. Um, if you want the light to bounce around more than once, uh, we want to turn on our secondary GI engine, and a really good choice for that is the Radiance Point Cloud. It gives you really good uh, high performance uh, secondary bounces. Um, this number of GI bounces here for this scene, the secondary GI is not going to play a big role, so three is fine, more than fine. For interior scenes, you might want to crank this up to like five, maybe up to ten. Um, the next thing you'll want to change most likely is the screen radius. You can reduce that number to say eight or four even. And what's this? What this is going to do is going to you make more irradiance point cloud points, uh, smaller points, which are therefore more likely to actually be used by the brute force, and that's going to re uh, prevent any retracing from happening, which can slow things down. So essentially, lower screen radius is going to improve uh, your performance here. Uh, and we render, and you know we don't see a huge difference from the previous frame, but there is some additional bounce lighting going on there. So that's just a quick and dirty uh, or quick and nice way to set up uh, your GI high performance, uh, not likely to flicker during animations. Uh, so that's great. Um, we will be creating another video uh, specific to GI. So stay tuned for that. I mean, this is just too broad of a topic.
uh, to cover, you know, real quickly in, 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 a, in a tutorial intro type video. Um, photon mapping, we're not going to cover at all today for the same reason. Uh, but, you know, we have a whole bunch of detail on that and GI actually in the, in the documentation. So feel free to browse through that or wait for um, the upcoming videos. For subsurface scattering, Okay, so let's go ahead and load up our subsurface scattering test scene here. And what do we have? So these set, so just to start off, subsurface scattering in Redshift is a point-based technique. Uh, when you render with subsurface scattering, Redshift's gonna create as a pre-pass a bunch of points around all objects that have a subsurface scattering material applied to them. Um, these settings here in the render globals control sort of the quality of the of the subsurface scattering. Um, the rate here is going to control. Here, let me let me just do a quick render so you can see. Um, there we go. So the rate controls essentially like how many uh, points are generated. The interpolation quality essentially controls how those points are used, um, and. For this scene, as you can see, these settings are fine, and, and for many scenes, these defaults, these settings here are the defaults. These are gonna be fine for a lot of scenes. Um, when these might become a problem is if you have geometry that has a, a ton of uh, fine detail in it, if you had some kind of liquid with lots of small droplets or something, uh, you'd wanna use you know, high, and in some cases, maybe even very high for rate and then uh, higher interpolation quality as well. But for this scene, these settings are, are plenty uh, fine. The number of GI rays, uh, again, here, no problem with this number. Uh, you'll wanna increase this when you have really high frequency lighting, um, you know, hard to catch sort of lighting um, that's gonna affect the subsurface scattering. So let's take a look at the actual material for this guy. Um, this is where, you know, we're going to be able to affect the look of it. Um, we've selected the, the skimmed milk preset. Um, we can we can change the colors here. I mean, these are set up based on the preset, but if we, we change this to a, a blue scatter color, um, you're going to see that that affects the, the, the way the light is scattered through the, through the, the, the dragon. Um, Let's just switch that back because this doesn't look very good. Um, and we can increase uh, either, the, we can increase the scale here if we wanted to make this look uh, more waxy. Um, you can play with the scale. So for example, if I reduce this down to a very small number, this is gonna reduce the subsurface effect to almost nothing as you can see. You know, it's, it's practically di uh, diffuse now. If you increase this to a big number, um, you're going to get like a ton of subsurface scattering. Um, you know, it looks very waxy now. Um, if we bring that back down to, to two, let's say, um, we get a more moderate effect. Um, this, this material also supports reflections. Uh, so if you wanted to get some reflections on here, you can use, don't use too large of a number for weight. Otherwise, the reflection will basically uh, take over and, and, and you won't really see your subsurface scattering effect anymore. Uh, but you see here, you know, with a weight of 0.1, we have a nice combination of some reflections and the subsurface scattering. So that looks nice. Um, moving on, we have the system tab here. And basically here you find a bunch of options that are semi unrelated and don't have a good place to put them elsewhere. Um, but basically the parts you'll be interested in mostly will be the feedback display, the material override, uh, the bucket rendering, and your CUDA, CUDA device list down here. Uh, so the feedback display uh, shows uh, warnings and errors um, as, as they happen. Uh, here we don't have any, but you'll see them here. And it also shows uh, memory statistics for each CUDA device that, that's being used by Redshift. So, you know, I'm rendering with, with two GPUs here and I have memory statistics for both. Uh, the material override 
the selected and I'll render here and show you. Basically this overrides all the materials in the scene with a you know, perfectly diffuse material of this color and you can change that color. Uh, but in this case we've chosen gray and it sort of gives you like a clay render look. And this is particularly useful uh, to, re uh, to diagnose lighting issues uh, because you can very quickly get rid of all reflections, refractions, textures, and any other distractions and really focus on your lighting and then diagnose what's going on with your lighting. Um, next we have the bucket order. Um, here you can adjust the bucket size and the, the pattern that's used to, to fill in the buckets. So here if I choose spiral you can see it's you know sort of doing a spiral pattern uh, whereas the the Hilbert um, is, is a bit, bit of a different pattern. Um, horizontal is just going to start from the top and keep going. Here I have two GPUs so they're coming in, in a little bit out of order. Um, the CUDA devices down here, this basically just lists which CUDA devices I have enabled. So here I have both my Quadro K6000 and the GTX 750 Ti enabled for Redshift. Um, so if I wanted to not use this one, for example, I would do this. And But notice that as it says here, you do need to restart Maya for this setting to take effect. So if I render now, I'm still using both GPUs. Uh, so that's that's probably all you care about on the system tab, um, typically. And that basically covers um, most of the settings that that you'll be interested in here. Uh, we're, we're, we'll cover the memory section in a, in, a, in another video. Um, and that does it for our first part of this uh, introductory tutorial. Uh, stay tuned for part two where we'll talk about lights, uh, shaders, um, tessellation settings, and displacement. Um, basically everything you'll need to, to get up and running with Redshift. Cheers.